Hello everybody and welcome to Human Performance in Extreme Environments. In this video lecture we're going to cover diving and hyperbaric physiology. A couple different topics. We're going to first talk a little bit about the physics of diving. Don't worry, it's not going to be lots of equations or anything like that. Then we're going to talk about respiratory responses to a hyperbaric environment, followed by barotrauma and decompression sickness and inert gas narcosis. and uh, an alternative that gets rid of a lot of these issues, saturation diving. So let's start with the physics of diving and we're really just going to be talking about what the water environment is like and a couple of laws, namely Boyle's Law and Henry's Law. So the first thing that we really need to understand, it might be a little bit of a perspective shift, is right now at sea level there is a big column of air pushing down on you. And so if you want to have a look at this figure here, um, this shows altitude on the vertical axis and measured in kilometers, zero all the way up to 30 kilometers up in the, uh, up in the air, not far off 20, um, 20 miles or so. And then on the horizontal axis, we see atmospheric pressure. Okay, this is measured in millimeters of mercury. 100, 200, 300, 400, all the way up to, to 700 uh, millimeters of mercury. So imagine that you're standing down here uh, at sea level. There is a big column of air that pushes on top of you. And that column of air uh, puts, well, roughly one atmosphere pushing down on top of you. And that's equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So this gigantic column of air that's pushing down on top of you at sea level, it's 23 miles high and it's just exerting a weight on top of you, okay? So that's equal to one atmosphere. It's a pressure unit on top of you. Now air, it's very compressible. So half an atmosphere uh, is at roughly an altitude of about five uh, kilometers or so maybe five and a half kilometers, about 3.4 miles. Now, as you start to go underwater, that column gets heavier because water weighs more than air. So each 33 feet that you go down underwater, you add another atmosphere because water is so heavy. The, the water has a greater density than air and water is far less compressible than air. So just to um, to, to say this in, in, a, in another way, about 23 miles up, there is one column of air that exerts one atmosphere on you. As you go down underwater, down about 33 feet, there is another atmosphere of pressure exerted on you. The same amount of pressure that's exerted by 23 miles of air column is exerted with just 33 feet of water column. And that blows a lot of people's minds. But it also explains that when you, you know, dive down, down underwater, you feel pressure, right? You feel pressure pushing on your mask. Uh, you feel pressure pushing on your skin and your ears start to pop when you dive deep underwater. That's the pressure exerted by water. And if you go down to 33 feet, then that's equivalent to a one atmosphere of pressure. But in total, it's two atmospheres because you have 23 miles of air that's one column, that's one pressure, one atmosphere, and then you go down another 33 feet, that's another atmosphere. So in total, you have two atmospheres pushing down on you. Now, that's nice to understand that, but there are some very important and deadly physiological consequences for that. Now, the human body, it has many air-filled cavities. It has the lungs, you have sinuses. Uh, even within tissues and organ systems, there is a lot of, of air. Now, you can really cause damage in some of these closed compartments when you start uh, going up and down uh, from high pressures to low pressures, or when you go down a couple atmospheres. You can really cause damage to some of those areas. You can cause rapid expanding and contracting. And remember, we're dealing with organ systems here. They can't really go through a lot of expanding and contracting without having some sort of a, a side effect. And so that explains the environment that we're gonna be talking about in this lecture. This is a water environment and it's, 
it can be rather, rather dangerous. So the first law that I want to talk about is Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law describes the inverse relationship between volume and pressure. I think the best way to apply this law to, to diving physiology is to talk about what happens to divers in different situations. So let's go ahead and look at this figure over here. Um, this little column, we have the different measures of atmospheres. So remember at sea level, that's equivalent to one atmosphere. But then if you go down to uh, 10 meters or 33 feet down, there's an extra weight associated with the column of water and 33 feet is equivalent to another atmosphere. So when you're down at 33 feet, you have two atmospheres pushing down on you, go down another 33 feet, three atmospheres, another 33 feet, four atmospheres, and you get the, the gist here. If a diver uh, is floating around on the top of this water and they take a big, big breath, and then it just so happens that uh, a full adult grown male can breathe in about six liters. So if they take one big breath, fill up their lungs to six liters, and they dive down 10 meters, 33 feet, then they will have um, a greater amount of pressure exerted on their body and their lungs. And so what would happen is based upon this inverse relationship between volume and pressure, uh, as the pressure increases, the volume will decrease. So uh, the diver started off with six liters uh, at the, the top uh, at sea level, big breath, and as they dove down, the pressure exerted force on them and that decreased their lung volume to half. So now they're back down to three liters. That's the volume of their lungs. And then they hold their breath, dive around, swim around, and then go all the way back up to the top. And then their lung volume expands again back to six liters, okay? And that's perfectly safe. There's no damage that was really done. If they were to dive down deeper and deeper and deeper beyond 33 feet on just one breath, then they'll start to see a greater pressure exerted on them. Um, but as long as they're holding their breath, you know, going back up, the only danger is just the excess pressure that's you know, being put on their body. And that in and of itself is very dangerous, but most humans can't go so far down that they would cause real damage to their, to their lungs. But now let's take the example of where we can get into a little bit of trouble. So let's say that we have a scuba diver who's using a self-contained breathing apparatus down around, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's say that they're down around um, at one atmosphere. So let's say that a scuba diver takes a full breath, that's six liters, at 33 feet or 10 meters. So they take a big full breath, they have six liters in their lungs. And then let's say that they hold their breath and then they ascend one atmosphere. So they ascend to the surface. Well, what's gonna happen is that initial six liter breath is gonna expand, it's gonna double. It's gonna double to 12 liters. So the thing is, your lungs can't hold 12 liters of air. They can only ha uh, handle about six liters. So what happens? Your lungs burst. And that is an example of barotrauma. And so that is what we're gonna be talking about, that and other different types of barotrauma uh, for the remainder of this lecture. But it's important that we understand what this law is, Boyle's Law. It describes this inverse relationship between volume and pressure, and it's important to understand it. The other law that we need to know about, it's Henry's Law. Henry's Law stipulates that the amount of gas dissolved in a fluid is directly proportional to the pressure. Now, normally at sea level, certain gases, they're not absorbed by our body, but they're very plentiful in the atmosphere. Uh, one, it's nitrogen. And we also have other gas, gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, and we need oxygen to live, and carbon dioxide is a byproduct of ATP generation, and we breathe that out. So as it turns out, gases like nitrogen, they can be dissolved in the body uh, as you start to go down to depth. So here's the diver at sea level. Uh, no nitrogen is absorbed in their body. It's just in and out, it's inert. But as that diver starts to go down, then some of that nitrogen will then increase, uh, the, the, the pressure exerted by the water will then increase its absorption into body tissues at depth. 
And so if they ascend too quickly, then that nitrogen can bubble out very, very quickly and that can lead to something called decompression sickness or the bends and that can kill you. So this is an example of, of Henry's law. The amount of gas dissolved in a liquid is directly proportional to the, to the pressure. Uh, so, and, and so that's another law that you need to know of. Okay, so with that understanding of these basic laws, let's talk about the respiratory responses to a hyperbaric environment. So we're gonna specifically talk about breathing with a regulator. If humans are to survive in this undersea world, uh, they need to have various forms of equipment. And the most important form of equipment, it's the regulator. So when you dive, you breathe through this regulator. And ultimately what it does, it regulates the flow of air to the lungs. But there are a couple problems with this regulator or physiological implications of using the regulator that we need to be aware of. Uh, and we'll keep these in mind as we go through the rest of the lecture. So first, these regulators, they increase the work of breathing. So for one, they increase the anatomical dead space. Now, it, you might be aware of um, respiratory anatomy, but you don't need to be for, for this class. But just picture that you have this long tube that comes up from your lungs and ultimately goes up your throat and you know, to, to your nose and to your mouth. Uh, and then as you get into your lungs, you have uh, these more delicate structures that allow for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The, the pipe that goes from your lungs all the way up to your mouth, you can't exchange any gases there. It's dead space. And that's what we're referring to here, the anatomical dead space. So you have to work to push air ultimately all the way down beyond that anatomical dead space to the lungs where it can have a physiological effect. And that takes work. When you have a regulator on, you increase the length of that anatomical dead space uh, and that can make it harder to breathe. Picture breathing through uh, a really long snorkel. Uh, if you've ever tried that, most snorkels are only about a foot or so because uh, the anatomical dead space is uh, the maximum of what we can really use physiologically to, to get the air down into our lungs. So it makes it harder to, to uh, breathe when you have this longer anatomical dead space. Also, these regulators, they increase the required inspiratory pressure needed to overcome the pressure in the regulator. And the best way to think about this is you have to work really hard to suck in to get the oxygen. So you have to really, really work to, to, to take that breath. And as a result of this, they can increase the metabolic cost of breathing, the metabolic rate as you're breathing. Uh, and also the last thing I want to mention, uh, regulators, they increase air usage. Uh, and it can ultimately you know, decrease your, your dive time, which is you know, not a lot of fun for people when they wanna enjoy their, their sport, their recreational sport of, uh, that they've chosen. So with those things in mind, with the laws uh, in mind and the inherent problems with the regulator, let's talk about specific forms of barotrauma. And let's first talk about Boyle's Law, which we kind of already alluded to. Okay, so let's talk about some of these problems now. The golden rule of diving, if you didn't know, is to never hold your breath. The volume of air in your lungs remain constant if you hold your breath. And that's a problem, and you're subject to Boyle's Law, and you can see you know, lots of problems with lungs expanding, and, and you know, as we'll talk about here, it can, it, can, it can lead to death. So, the main problems associated with Boyle's Law and holding your breath uh, occur with breath hold and a rapid ascent. So when you're down low, you take a big breath and then you ascend too quickly. So in the example we talked about, you know, if you're down about two atmospheres and then you hold your breath uh, and you take a big breath and then hold your breath and then ascend, your lung volumes rapidly expand. And this can result in many different problems that I'd like you to know about. Uh, one of the more dangerous ones, though they're all dangerous, it's pneumothorax. This is when your lungs rupture and collapse, and obviously you can suffocate. You can't get air in and out of your lungs then uh, to, to feed your, your tissue. Uh, you can also encounter air embolisms, and this is basically just a release of large volumes of air into your pulmonary circulation. That's the blood flow that moves over your, your lungs. Now, what can happen is the bubbles, they expand through the body, and they can be deadly if they reach certain areas like your brain or your cerebrospinal fluid, so very dangerous. 
And then uh, aerosinusitis. This is a problem that happens in your sinuses. It's when you have capillary ruptures in your sinuses due to a rapid air expansion. It can be very painful. So the problems with Boyle's Law uh, that relate to rapid ascent, you know, normally it involves things expanding and popping. But there are also problems related to rapid descent. So that's when you're going down. So this is when you're gonna have problems related to a greater squeeze. So the first problem that I wanted to mention is lung squeeze. This is basically when your respiratory spaces in your lungs become very compressed. And this can cause real damage to lung tissue and your alveoli. Your alveoli is the, the, the small site of gas exchange between your lungs and the blood. Uh, and then the blood on that side, you can also have a damage there. That's your pulmonary capillary. It may burst and that can cause blood to ultimately uh, flow and leak into the lungs. And that is uh, one way that you can drown. So very deadly. Mac mask squeeze, uh, that can cause problems with the capillaries in your eye. You can see ruptures uh, and your eyes look totally bloodshot. Um, luckily, it's very easily relieved, you know, just by holding and breathing through your nose while you're wearing a mask and sort that out. Uh, Erotitis, this is a rupture in your tympanic membrane in your ear, so you're going to have potential problems with hearing and also um, with balance. Uh, again, this is easy to be relieved, and you've probably done this before if you're diving down low just in a pool. Uh, all you need to do is just uh, force air through your eustachian tube, basically pinch your nose and blow out and you'll be fine. And then another one uh, is hood squeeze. That's when water is trapped between your diving hood and your ear and that can actually rupture your tympanic membrane, your, your eardrum. Um, but again, you no know, water flushes in the ear uh, and that can alter the equilibrium and cause disorientation. But you can you know, get past this with the appropriate type of equipment and, and you know, compression procedures as you, as you go down or decompression procedures, I should say. Okay, so speaking of decompression, let's talk about decompression sickness, also referred to as the bends. So before we were dealing with uh, Boyle's Law, now that we're talking about decompression sickness, we're dealing with Henry's Law. So we're dealing with gases uh, and pressure and bubbling in and out of the, the solution. So in particular, during descent, you know pressure can increase and during ascent, pressure can decrease. The problem here can happen on either side of this. So first off, during a descent, the pressure increases and that means that nitrogen is gonna be compressed into the solution. It's gonna be compressed specifically into your blood and into your body tissues. And this is normal uh, as you dive, but you need to be aware of it. Now, during an ascent, your, your pressure ultimately will decrease. If you go nice and slow, this nitrogen will naturally dissolve out of the blood and out of the tissue, and then you just breathe it out. But if you ascend too rapidly, this nitrogen will very rapidly bubble out of the solution. And remember, it was in solution in the skin and the muscles and the synovial fluid and the blood and the nervous system. If it very rapidly bubbles out of those areas, then you can experience severe pain. Uh, that's why they call it the bends, you're bent over, uh, and many other issues. And again, it can be fatal. The treatment here is recompression followed by slow decompression. And so many, um, many uh, areas that focus on diving recreationally, um, there well, depends where they are, but uh, they can be located near decompression chambers. And so if you found that you ascended too quickly, then one option is to dive back in the water and then go back down to depth and then ascend more slowly. But that's not an option for most people who have the bends. You have to be uh, shipped to a hospital with a decompression tank, they can increase the pressure uh, in the chamber to recreate the, the slow descent that you would need in order to allow uh, nitrogen to more slowly uh, leave, your, uh, leave your body tissues. And then you got a chance. So divers, if you've ever um, gone diving before, then uh, you would be familiar with uh, dive tables. So decompression sickness, it's influenced by many different factors. 
the depth of the dive certainly, and the duration of the dive, and then how quickly you ascend. So these dive tables, they tell you how long you can stay at a particular depth uh, so as to avoid decompression sickness or the bends. But there's unfortunately many different factors that can influence uh, you know, the uh, decompression sickness. And this is why there's a fair amount of rigorous training for those who want to go diving. You have to make sure that you're certified and you understand a lot of these factors. So for example, body fat content. Uh, body fat retains nitrogen. So if you have an increased body fat percentage, you're at an increased risk of decompression sickness. You need to make sure that you're ascending more slowly. So everyone has a, a unique uh, rate of ascent. Uh, multiple dives. So nitrogen can remain dissolved in tissues over multiple dives and it can accumulate in your tissues over multiple dives. And so that means it can increase your rate of decompression sickness and you have to adjust uh, your ascent based upon the number of dives that you've had and diving at altitude. So if there's a, a decrease in the surface barometric pressure, that will increase the pressure gradient. And so this is why people are advised not to fly for 24 hours after they've, they've dived. Because you go up very, very high, you can uh, accelerate decompression sickness. Uh, and then patent oval uh, foramen or PFO. It's a small channel between the right and left atria. And ultimately what it can do is shift nitrogen from the venous to arterial blood. And this is a genetic condition. It can increase your risk of decompression sickness. It's not very common though. All right, let's talk about inert gas narcosis, sometimes referred to as the rapture of the deep. Uh, the other term here, it's uh, nitrogen narcosis. Uh, now, there's a couple issues that we need to, to mention here. The first is that nitrogen, when it's at very high pressures, it can act as an anesthetic. So it can you know, decrease your pain perception. So that's why it's inert gas narcosis. When you're at depths of greater than four atmospheres, uh, you start to experience symptoms of intoxication and euphoria uh, and narcosis. Uh, and so that's why they call it rapture of the deep. Uh, as you go deeper, then somewhere in the region of seven to 10 atmospheres, the issues become more pronounced. So for example, you might see mental processes and decision-making slowed. You might even have loss of memory and neuromuscular coordination issues. And in a worst case, a loss of consciousness. You don't wanna have a loss of consciousness when you're down seven to 10 atmospheres. It can be very deadly. There are some other issues with nitrogen. Um, it can inhibit your shivering response and it can alter your perception of the cold. And this is important because both of these mechanisms are there to defend your body temperature. So what this means is that you might be more likely to have uh, hypothermia uh, with when you're using uh, nitrogen uh, as, as your main gas. And there are a number of diving regulations that recommend against using compressed gas at greater than six atmospheres. So as you start going below this depth, you switch from nitrogen uh, over to helium and it can alter and really get rid of some of these issues uh, altogether. Saturation diving, as you start to go deeper, this is really where you need to be. So saturation diving, uh, we're gonna talk about, so we are on the same page about what it is. We're gonna talk about thermal conductivity and heat loss, and then high pressure neurological syndrome. So up until now, we've been talking about uh, either free diving without any equipment uh, from the surface, just going down as deep as you can and then going back up, or if you want to go down deeper using a respirator, so a scuba systems. But it doesn't really help you if you want to go down deeper for some of those reasons that we talked about nitrogen narcosis. So there are some problems with scuba, as I just alluded. You know, one, the diving time is shorter and you just can't really go that deep. So if you want to go deeper, you need to uh, use saturation diving. And so this is when, you can kind of see the image on the right, uh, when these divers will enter a decompression chamber for several days and the pressure will be lowered to match the pressure of the depth that they want to work at or whatever. Mostly for this sort of effort, it's, it's work related. Uh, so the goal is to reach equilibrium with the pressure. And then once that happens, the chamber is then lowered 
to the depth that the divers want to work at and then the divers work at the depth for a prolonged period of time and then they go back and forth between working in their chambers it could be weeks for example days uh, and then the chamber when the work is done it's returned to the surface and the divers decompress for several days it's a whole world out there of, of workers who just spend a lot of their lives doing this sort of thing there are some issues with it though so as we said earlier, you run into some problems with using nitrogen as your inert gas. Um, as you start going lower, saturation diving is the main uh, tool, and you start to use helium because you know ultimately it eliminates this uh, nitrogen narcosis that we talked about, but there are some other issues. Now you have to potentially deal with the risk of hypothermia. So helium, uh, it has direct effects on thermal conductivity and heat loss. In particular, helium can depress your thermoregulatory ability. Specifically, there's a lower deep body temperature with higher rates of shivering and metabolism. It's going to delay the onset of your shivering and it also delay the onset of vasoconstriction and it can alter your sensitivity to thermal stimuli. All of these things are in place to help defend your body temperature. So you're removing a lot of these defenses. So um, as a result of this, you're more likely to experience hypothermia when you're working at great depth. Uh, also, um, there can be higher rates of conductivity, which can then increase your respiratory heat losses. And this just compounds everything. It just pushes you closer to hypothermia. So you really need to be careful uh, of that when you're, uh, when you're saturation diving. And so the last thing that I wanted to mention here, it's high pressure neurological syndrome. And this is basically caused by high levels of compression during rapid descent. So when you're, when you're going down, uh, the symptoms here include lethargy and fatigue. Ultimately, this can lead to motor dysfunction, tremors, nausea, and potentially seizures. And there could be some impairment of cognitive uh, ability. So that's it for, for this video lecture. Let's leave it there and uh, we'll pick it up in the next video lecture.